Sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Speculation about Apple transitioning some or all of its Mac computer lineup from Intel to ARM is running hot and heavy again, this following an offhand rumor by supply chain exfiltrator extraordinaire Guo Mingji earlier this week. I've already done a whole video on how Steve Jobs' famous keynote announcing the previous PowerPC to Intel transition could be replayed almost note by note for an Intel to ARM transition. Hit subscribe to see all of it. So now, I want to touch on what happens next, the transition itself. I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is Vector. A decade and a half ago, Intel was already making commodity x86 chips for everything, from laptops to desktops to workstations. In other words, everything Apple needed. Right now, publicly, Apple is only making custom ARM chips for tablets, phones, and even lower powered devices. Sure, those ultra mobile tablet chips are as they say, screamers, and in terms of power efficiency, put everything in the same class to utter desolate shame, including and especially Intel. But they're still ultra mobile chips. So as is, they could probably power a new MacBook or MacBook Air really, really well. With incredibly fast performance, taking full advantage of neural engines, encode decode blocks, accelerators, secure enclaves, and all of that, as well as with phenomenal battery life. Same for a Mac Nano or whatever Apple would call a box that would blend the very best characteristics of an Apple TV and a Mac Mini. In fact, that story tells itself so well, it's not hard to imagine Apple forgoing any awkward developer boxes like during the Intel transition and just announcing a Mac ARM SDK that developers can run on existing iPad Pro or Apple TVs to get their apps ported over with way less fuss and much higher availability must. MacBooks especially avoid a lot of the software transition pain as well, since most of the people who buy them aren't doing so to run DaVinci Resolve or Adobe After Effects, Pro Tools, or Maya. Office was one of the biggest pain points back then, but now Microsoft is busy working on Windows 10X, 1010, whatever these letter numbers are, and its own ARM transition. And there's Office Online and G Suite, and hell, Apple announced iWork for ARM back with the original iPad in 2010. Office for iPad has been around for years already as well, and so have a baker's dozen of Adobe apps, and so many indie apps that make such incredible use of Apple's cores and kits and metals that, with Catalyst Now and Swift UI soon, could make more than enough tools available for anyone using an ultra mobile ARM based Mac going forward. Especially since Apple hard killed 32 bit Mac apps this year, greatly reducing what would have to be ported, much less emulated over. The MacBook Pro and iMac are more interesting. Here, people would not only want, but need their Xcode and Final Cut Pro and all the Pro apps. Johnny Saruji and Apple's Platform Technologies Org could have designs and architecture already all laid out for the level of silicon needed to support them. Apple's in-house Pro apps could be done and ready to go at launch. Others, like Adobe, might take a more annoying amount of time and or emulation. Apple could simply flip the table on the current status quo. Instead of a Core i7 or i9 with a T2 coprocessor, they could have a T7 or T9 with Intel deprecated down to the coprocessor slot. But unless there's a strict phase out schedule announced up front, that might make compatibility faster, but the transition take longer. Just look at what happened with the decades long 32 to 64 bit transition. And that brings up another question. Right now, for the majority of Macs, you can get a range of processor options from the i5 to the i9. Would Apple do the same thing with an ARM setup? Or are things like the MacBook Air, which currently only offers one Intel processor option, paving the way for a future where there's only one processor option for Macs as well? And then there's the GPU question. Apple is already making its own custom graphic cores for mobile, and modern Macs already handle dispatch between Intel processors, ARM coprocessors for things like H.265 and AMD GPUs. I assume they'd work just as well with Intel demoted or removed from that chain, especially since, unlike Nvidia, AMD is happy to let Apple work down to the metal, and with metal currently the Metal 2 framework, as an abstraction layer to make processing less a bunch of separate silicon and more a unified set of resources to be targeting on a task by task basis. The Mac Pro and the iMac Pro are of course the most interesting. Apple just released the brand new Mac Pro and because it's so modular, it could easily last customers a decade. That means the workstation could have both the biggest challenges but the least immediate pressure. Again, 
Johnny Saruji's team could very well have massively multi-core ARM-based blades ready and chomping at the literal bits. And given the modularity of the Mac Pro with everything from how it handles GPUs to custom accelerator cards like Afterburner, Apple could again flip the tables around and offer x86 on a card for as long as anyone needs it. They've also worked around their loggerheads with NVIDIA by getting more and more high-end app makers to port to AMD for the Mac Pro. So maybe even a workstation transition won't take as long or be as painful as it might otherwise have been. Yes, Apple absolutely mismanaged the Mac from like 2015 to 2018, took too many wrong turns and sacrificed too many resources to far more popular products. But it's also fair to say many of the products that did ship were delayed, constrained, and compromised far beyond reason by Intel's years and years of missing roadmaps, failures to die shrink, pushing off feature implementations, and otherwise doing the exact opposite of why Apple transitioned to them to begin with. And that's what the ARM transition will fix, by giving Apple the one thing it lacked on the Mac, the same thing that made it so successful with iPhone and iPad, control of its own silicon destiny. It's the exact same reason we're building Nebula, so that education creators like Sarah Z, Kento Bento, Lindsay Ellis, Legal Eagle, Thomas Frank, Wendover, and yours truly have a place to try out new content ideas that might just not work on YouTube. I mean, just take one look at Real Engineering's incredible Logistics of D-Day original series. And because Nebula now comes bundled with CuriosityStream, you also get access to thousands of documentaries and series, like Secrets of the Solar System. Talk about logistics. It's the ultimate guide to our little corner of the universe, told by the dedicated people who sent spacecraft up and out to explore the sun, the planets, and so much more. By signing up for just $19.99 a year, for the whole year, you won't just be helping me out, but the entire educational community as we work together to build a place where we can create exactly the kinds of content you really want us to create. Go to curiositystream.com vector for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series, and now Nebula as well. Enter the promo code vector to start your membership completely free for the first 31 days. Thanks CuriosityStream and thanks to all of you for supporting the show. So has the Mac been living a triple life? Will Tim Cook and Craig Federighi announce the Intel to ARM transition at WWDC 2020, WWDC 2021? What will the first ARM Mac be and when will we see it? Hit like if you do, subscribe and arm that bell gizmo. It not only helps out the channel, it's the only way YouTube will actually tell you when new shows go live and then hit up the comments and let me know. Thank you for watching, see you next video.